Well, here we are. It's our third week of digging into our call to mission as the body of Christ, as a, as a local church, as a global Methodist church, to make disciples that worship passionately, love extravagantly, and today we talk about witness boldly. You know, we worship passionately because Jesus himself reminded us of the greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, with our whole self. And when our whole self is engaged in loving God, we will and we do call out his worth passionately from the heart. Then we love extravagantly because God loved us first, gave himself for us, an over-the-top gracious love for God and others that we have because of God's love for us. Now, what about this witness boldly? Now, that may well make most of us kind of nervous. I mean, what have I gotten myself into? I'm sure most of us have at some time or another had awkward experiences with this idea of witness. You know, there's those witness protesters on the street usually hollering about the awful sin of whoever they're protesting against. Is that witness? <laughs> We've seen, if not in person, then on TV or in the movies of the fire and brimstone preachers calling down the wrath of God on, well... I'm not even going to get into that. Is that witness? Or there's tracts, you know, those little booklets that talk about maybe the four spiritual laws or the Roman road or some version of we're all sinners and that separates us from God. And if you don't want to go to hell, you got to accept Jesus as your savior. And those tracts certainly have brought many people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So they're not of no use, but you know, it can also leave a sour taste in the mouths of some people. So is that witness? Or maybe it's the person who comes knocking at your door. If that's what being and hearing witness brings to your mind, then you might already be thinking, well, that's part of the mission of the church that's got to be the scariest part, or at the very least, the part of the mission that you just kind of ignore. Well, I'll confess that this part is probably the most difficult one for me. How do you know what to say, when to say it, who to say it to? Do you keep soldiering on telling the story even if the person shows no interest? I mean, after all, we live in a time where all religion is supposed to be personal, private, certainly not in public view. So to start off, that's not what we're talking about. Witness is not a formula. It's not a knocking on doors, standing on street corners, filling a quota, although any of those might actually occur and be part of witness. But no, what we're talking about is more like the witness to a traffic accident, a witness to a crime, a witness in a courtroom. Have you ever watched Judge Judy? I, I know. I know Judge Judy is a courtroom. It's staged for TV. It's a lot more flamboyant than a judge in a real courtroom probably is. But if you've ever even watched just a little of Judge Judy, she's very good at cutting through all of the he said, he said, she said. They just tell, just tell me what you saw. Tell me what you did. I don't care about what you think. I don't care about what you feel. Just tell me exactly what happened. That's a witness. A witness in court, that's what it's all about. That's what this witness boldly is about. Get that over with. So here are the questions I want to ask today. What can we learn from Scripture about this idea of witness? What can we learn about witness from Psalms? And then, 
What do we do about it? So let's start with, what does scripture tell us about what it means to witness? I mean, if we turn to the Old Testament, there's the story of Jonah. Now, you might know about the story of Jonah and the whale, but just in case you don't remember the story, God told Jonah to go to Sin City to preach to them, to repent of their sin, come near to God, and avoid destruction. And Jonah was not happy about that instruction. Uh, he would have been a lot more happy if the people of Sin City would just go to, well, hell. So Jonah went the actual opposite direction to get a far, as far away from God and as far away from that city as he could. And that's when he was thrown overboard, swallowed by the great fish, vomited up onto a beach. And then God says to him again, go to Sin City and tell them to repent, seek forgiveness and avoid destruction. So, <coughs> Jonah was charged with repeating what God said, telling the city what God told him to say. And here's what it says in Jonah chapter 3. It says, The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Apparently, Jonah got word-for-word word instruction from God about what to say. And well, I suppose if I had resisted the instructions I got before, ran away from God, and what I was told to do, and then got swallowed by a great finish, got vomited back up onto shore, I think I would probably follow directions the second time Exactly. I don't think I'd ad lib or add any of my own words. Now, I don't bring this up as the way that we should witness boldly. I just bring it up only to say that when God lays it on your heart, when God whispers that it's time to tell your story of your walk with God, the words will come and the rest and the results will come as well. So let's move to the New Testament, to the Apostles. They wrote after Jesus returned to the Father, left this earth. And as he was leaving, disappearing into the clouds, Jesus left instructions and he said, Go into all the world making disciples of every ethnic group, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Let's start with John. John was one of the disciples that was there when Jesus left, and John wrote his first letter. So let me read you the exact words from the start of this letter. John writes, We announce to you what existed from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have seen and our hands handled about the word of life. The life was revealed, and we have seen, and we testify, and announce to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also announce to you, so that you can have fellowship with us. It's the words of God for the people of God. Did you hear how many times he said, We've heard, we've seen, we touched. And then he says, seen again. <laughs> That's bold. That's strong. We tell you about it. We're witnesses like the witness to a car crash. He says, seen and heard over and over again. Wow, that's, that's a reality check. I mean, not speculation. Not pie in the pie, not some mystical vision, dreamlike trance, but reporting like a witness in court, like a newspaper recorder. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, we report to you. That's John. 
But I want to zero in a little bit more on the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. So there in Athens, Paul interacted with people um, in church, you know, well, a Jewish church called the synagogue. He did that every day in the city of Athens, and he did that out in the marketplace, too. It was a marketplace of ideas, in many ways more like an open university where people just sit around and talk about what they think and what they believe. Serious talk, debates. Not at all like a marketplace shopping mall, although that stuff was probably there, too. So Paul goes on talking with people in those places, but he seems to get kind of crossways with some of the lead philosopher thinkers. It was a lot like today's leading belief systems. There was one group that likes to debate that, well, they were the materialists. They were the ones that believed that nothing exists except the material world. So enjoy life while you can. That's the Epicureans. Sound familiar? You hear about that a lot today. And the other side was that there are gods everywhere, gods in everything. So live a virtuous life in tune with the universe. That's the Stoics. Well, Paul, it seems, got under the skin of both of the groups, and, and they brought him to trial, trial in the court on Mars Hill. Acts 17, verses 22 to 25, says this. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town, carefully observing all your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. And what you worship is unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples made with human hands. Nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. Did you notice, in this circumstance, talking to the people there on Mars Hill that, Mar that Paul did not mention Jesus. Now, maybe that's because what we have is an abbreviated report of what happened that day on Mars Hill. Maybe it's because Paul was just leading them step by step up to Jesus, and, and, and we just don't have that part of the story. But we do know that Paul did go on to talk about the resurrection of the dead. A little while, a little bit later in that passage that I quoted for you, it says, when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, then some began to ridicule Paul, <laughs> as they might well today if we talk about the resurrection of the dead. However, there were other people that said, we're going to hear from you more about this later. So Paul left off where many wanted to actually hear more. <laughs> you know, always leave them asking for more. So what did Paul do when he had the chance to bear witness, to tell what he saw and heard? Well, first, he went to where the people were. If we talk about what would that be like today, where, where Paul went, well, maybe it'd be that we were at a pub or a, a debating club, a, a dinner with friends where there can be long conversations. Whatever it might be, Paul went where the people were. Didn't expect them to come to him. Second, he definitely did not require them to be in church. That would be the synagogue, although he did do that too. He did talk at the synagogue, but he met many people in the marketplace, the marketplace of ideas. And then he talked with them about what they were talking about. He even quoted their thinkers, kind of like saying, well, everyone knows that. He related to what they were talking about, like maybe talking about current events, 
how our worldview as followers of Jesus helps us understand what's going on. Like one example might be about the evils of this world. You know, there really is no other worldview that accounts for the evil in the world. There's no other understanding of the nature of humanity that despite thousands of years of education, the highest standard of living ever, the lowest rate of poverty, where people lack even the most basic essential evil persists. Murders on the rise. Hate across whatever group you might want to name is on the rise. Only a fully Christian, fully biblical understanding of human nature explains why the world is the way that it is. That might be part of our witness. And perhaps most important, though, for Paul, is Paul spoke about his own personal experience. He did talk about how they were wrong, but it was based on his experience. He found his way into their conversation and made the connection into what they were thinking about, their worldview. It wasn't a debate just to convince them they're wrong. It was more, let me show you evidence you might not have thought about. And the result? The people wanted to hear more. They wanted him to talk more, explain more. Okay, so that's how some of the scripture might speak into and tell us about what it means to witness. How about the songs we sing? What can they tell us? You know, the great songs of witness or testimony, I can't even tell you how many personal testimonies I've heard of from people who came to Christ because of the uplifting messages that they heard on the radio. You know, maybe it was Caleb or, or the message. How about the song Amazing Grace? A very popular, even folk song. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's a personal story. Or how about the song Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Another song, popular song these days, uh, the song Redeemed by Big Daddy Weave. Goes, so I cast off these heavy chains, wipe every stain away, because I'm not who I used to be. I'm redeemed. For Charles Wesley, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued. And he sings, my chains fell off, my heart was free. And you, you can name your own song about life, even your how your life is changed by Jesus, rescued from separation from God and others, and even rescue from yourself. That's witness. Telling your story. Can you tell your story? If you are a follower of Jesus, have you ever written out what I would might call your elevator speech? You know, the one that takes less than two minutes to tell about why you walk with God, your, your reason for hope, your witness. As it says in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 6, uh, 15 and 16, in your hearts, revere Jesus as Lord always. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, against your good behavior in Jesus, might be ashamed of their slander. So how do we put that into practice? Paul engaged with people who were not yet followers of Jesus. He spent time with them, and he did it in their own place. As followers of Jesus, we have to meet people in their own space, in their own place. We really can't wait and expect people to come into church to come to us. 
I remember the story that Philip Yancey told at the beginning of his book, What's So Amazing About Grace? He tells the story of a woman greatly distressed, suicidal, who had fallen into prostitution and drug use and even confessed to selling her child into that life. But the preacher friend who told the story to Philip asked the woman, well, have you ever thought of coming to church? And the reply, why would I go there? I feel guilty enough already. And I tell you what, I heard it said more than once. I have to get cleaned up before I can go to church. I don't have the right kind of clothes. You know, and I sometimes wonder whether the way I dress, whether the way we dress, uh, what it communicates to a person who's never known Jesus, who's not ever been in a church. I wonder because I want nothing more than what I do, what I say, and even how I dress, that it communicate the love of Christ just as you are. And Jesus loves you, Jesus loves me so much that he does not want to leave me, leave you the way he found you. He doesn't want to leave me the way he finds me. Even now he wants me to be more and more like him. And for most of us, especially me, the question is, how do we meet and get to know people that are not already connected in church? And I confess, you know, it, it's rare for me. I hang out, I spend mostly time with people who are already connected to church, but, but I'm always looking for the opportunity where that can happen. Paul showed us that we need to be able to meet to connect with people in their own worlds, connect with the needs of the people we meet. And Jesus did it. Jesus met the woman at the well, a woman who was not even of the same religion, and he talked with her about thirst at the well. That was in chapter 4 of the book of John. But just before that, in chapter 3, he met a super-religious person and spoke with him in his own language. When he was with people who were literally hungry, Jesus talked about bread, the bread of life. He met and talked with people exactly where they were in life. It's about sharing our life with the people we meet. Finally, John, Paul, and Jesus talked about their personal experience. They didn't lecture, they didn't quote the four spiritual laws or, or go through any other evangelism training program. They talked about their personal experience. And you know, you will rarely find anyone get angry and upset or even rude with you if you're relating your personal experience and connect it with the things that the two of you share in common. You know, the story goes about the magic act, the magic show, Penn and Teller. It was after one of their performances in Las Vegas when Penn Gillette, he's the tall one, the talkative one, when Penn Gillette was signing autographs and there was a man holding a Bible who stood at the back of the line waiting to talk with Penn, who is an outspoken, avowed atheist. Well, sometime later, another fan went off on him, on Facebook, on that man who held the Bible, how he was totally disrespectful and, and even evil to bring a Bible to a man who did not believe. Well, Penn Gillette's response was perhaps quite unexpected. He took the time to make a YouTube video about it. And in that video, he said, if you truly believe that you hold the keys to eternal life, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them about it? Well, I tell you what, that shut the guy up that was so critical, and it surely has made me think about the times that maybe I've even been quiet when I could have shared my faith. 
That's the bold part. Not that we're disrespectful, not that we're loud, but that we're unafraid and without reservation ready to give an answer to the hope that lives within us. You know, if this story is not yet your story, but this life changed by Jesus Christ sounds appealing, sounds like the very thing you need, the light in life, like what you want. I'd love to talk with you more in detail, but even now this story can be your story. If you want to be part of this great story of Christ in you, the hope of glory, a hope that compels you to share it, a life changed to be like Jesus, just ask Jesus. Jesus can change you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given Jesus. Thank you that you've given us the disciples, the apostles, that we have examples of how we can share the work that you're doing in our lives with others, how we can speak boldly, not loudly, but clearly, without hesitation, because you have given life to us. Give us the strength, the power, the motivation, and the love of others because of the love of God to share the life that's in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, hear this blessing from me. Unto him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, even more than you can ask or think, God the Father Almighty, who gave us Jesus Christ, inhabit you with his Holy Spirit, that you have peace today, tomorrow, and every day from now. Amen.